Good evening, the city of Nagoya in Japan. Mother city of something which began as a deliberate time preventer, a sort of time killer, and which grew into a thing which affects now between 15 and 20 million Japanese every day. A sort of disease in which the attacks may be mild and last only for a few minutes, or in which they may la last all day, beginning at 9 o'clock in the morning and going on until 10 o'clock at night. Some get so crazed with it that it takes the place of work. It's now only nine in the morning, but these men are waiting for the pachinko halls to open. The pachinko illness affects every city in Japan these days, and in Nagoya, the mother city, this whole block is dedicated to pachinko halls. There are 37,000 pachinko machines in this city, and 10 people at least are estimated to play on every machine every day. That's a population roughly the size of say Sheffield or Leeds, playing pachinko in just this one city every day of the week. The bright strip lighting, the tempting and colorful displays of prizes, the mind-numbing noise of the 500 machines all being played at once, it lures them and hypnotizes them all. In all the islands of Japan, there are over two million machines, all of them basically the same. The price of the pachinko ball is two yen, about a halfpenny. You get 50 of them for two shillings, and they are currency as hard as cash. You feed them one at a time into the machine, and if the ball threads its way into one of the winning holes, you get 10 or 15 or 20 balls back according to the law of the prefecture in which you're playing. Hardly, you might think, enough of a game to draw 20 million people a day into the pachinko hall, but it does. And between six and nine in the evening, it's hard enough to find one of those two million machines empty. And once you get inside these pachinko halls, the lure of the places is even more difficult to understand. It must surely be one of the most uncomfortable ways ever devised of getting rid of your money. First of all, in 99.9% .9 of the places, you have to stand. I have managed to find a place with stools, because this is one of the very few places which sets out especially to cater for the middle-class clientele. And by heaven, they get them. This place is absolutely full tonight of office workers who have just come out from their offices and are now sitting in here. But quite apart from the standing, the gangways between the rows of machines are usually so narrow that all the time you're continuously being pushed in the back by somebody. Then, too, you can't sit quite straight at the machine. You have to turn in order to avoid the person on one side and also in order to keep putting the balls in the hole here. This gives you, after a very short time, a very nasty ache under the shoulder blades unless you happen to be trained to the job. Then if you try and watch your little balls going down here, you get absolutely cross-eyed because the space between here and here is so narrow. Well, I bought uh, 50 yen's worth of balls, let's see, three quarters of an hour ago. That gave me 25, and now, after playing for three quarters of an hour, I think I've got about 28. In three quarters of an hour, I've made three halfpence. Mind you, my style is pretty cumbersome. Automatic feeding on these machines is forbidden by law. Automatic feeding, the police claim, would make, speed the game up so much that it made it something more of a gamble than it is already, and in any case would attract a lot of lazy customers in who can't find the energy to play the game as it's played now. Well, I don't know. Three halfpence in three quarters of an hour seems to be about my limit. But some of these Japanese seem to feed these machines as slickly as any automatic system ever could. Look at this fella. The first legitimate business to grow out of the pachinko game is the manufacture of the machines themselves. In the city of Nagoya, there are currently about 45 factories turning them out. There are 365 nails on the faces of each of these machines. And these women knock them in, 365 of them, for tenpence a machine. The materials are flimsy and assembled by hand. The manufacturers don't want them to last long, and the average life is about a year. Anyway, the players tire of a particular design after a year. 
although changes can only be decorative and superficial. A different coloured light flashing when the winning holes are hit or a louder bell or a buzzer. It takes all these ingredients to add up to the creature which has enslaved the Japanese male in a way that the Japanese female has never yet quite managed to do. Put together, they amount to this. The pachinko machine. This is a highly successful model of the pachinko machine. And to be successful as a chinko machine, perhaps rather like a successful woman, you have to master the man, but only just. All the time, or most of the time, the man must think not only there's a chance of winning, but that he actually is winning. And this machine manages to do it. It's a matter of millimetres. A few millimetres either way on any of these nails here will turn this machine from a tough one into a soft one, a machine on which the expert can win every time. And there are experts in this game men who specialize in pachinko playing, men who very seldom do anything else. Every hall has its professional players, men who are supposed to be able to tell just by looking at the set of the pins and the holes, which is a soft machine and which particular hole is the easiest to play into. Sometimes they work in collaboration with the girls behind the boarded walkways, who will tell them any machine which seems to be paying off well. Professionals have been arrested for using magnets to get the balls into the winning hole. Many have tried bringing their own supply of undersized balls. There are estimated to be 200 gangs connected with the pachinko business in Japan. The managements tolerate them, trying only to defeat them by having skilled nail setters going round between midnight and one o'clock in the morning to alter the machines which the professionals have been winning on too richly, which would be all right if the nail setters were all angels. But if they leave the nails a little wide here and there and tell the gang boy, then they're in the money. And if they don't, they're probably in hospital. And it's not only the spivs who pride themselves on the speed and slickness with which they can hit a pachinko ball. University students and businessmen will boast about their prowess and their winnings too. That is the amazing thing about this nationwide obsession, for it's no less than that. The whole affair seems so crude, futile, boring, and it seems to be paying hard-earned money in order to take on one of those machine-minding jobs that most of us pray we'll never have to do for a living. Yet the absorption is complete. The men's eyes never stray from the machine face. They never exchange a word with their neighbor. The vast majority of these 20 million players a day come and go alone. And after the gaming, the ablutions, the cleansing, every modern pachinko hall is equipped with elaborate washing facilities, and everyone wants to make sure that no trace of the pachinko stain is carried out of the hall with them. There are, of course, reports of the people who have won on the large scale. The shoeshine widow who sent three sons to university. The policeman who bought his house. But apart from the organized gang men prepared to play all day, the winnings are bound to be small. No chance here to win on the football pool scale. Though the prize counters at some of the big halls look like department stores. You can win whiskey and biscuits, tin pineapple, dolls, chocolate, toy cars, cans of beer, orange juice, soya sauce, fish frying oil, soap, hair cream, Japanese port wine, tins of cocoa, even packets of cube sugar. Well, this is the really exciting moment, the time when you cash in. I haven't been doing very well for the last half an hour. I've just about got, let's see, uh, 30 left. So I've lost 20 balls. That is about 10 pence in my two hours. But even with 30, I can still get something. I can get a bar of chocolate, a big one and a small one, for 30 yen. Uh, I can get two packets of peanuts or a packet of rice biscuits with seaweed inside. Uh, I'll have a packet of these biscuits down here, please. Thank you very much indeed. Mind you, some fellows seem to do a lot better. Look at this fellow, for instance. He's got, I'd say, about uh, just over 150 there. And he's getting, what is it? It's a uh, bottle of whiskey. Yeah. Some fellows have all the luck. <laughs>